I was there in the 60s. It wasn't that great. It wasn't really <laughs> that great. You're telling us now? Yeah. It was okay, you know. <laughs> but it wasn't that good. There was actually less happening, if you can believe that. You know, it was like the Beatles and the Stones. What else was there, you know? Until like 67 and then you had San Francisco. But you had to travel a long way to see a good rock and roll band. <laughs> First of all, I was imitating, you know, to be honest with you. I was copying what I heard on record and trying to do it that way. And as time went by, um, when I started to meet my heroes, for instance, when I met Freddie King, when I met Muddy Waters, they didn't want to hear me play like them, mm. right? So they wanted to hear me play like me. And that's when I realized that I had to develop some kind of personality of my own with my mm. music. Being what I am can be lonely sometimes because I feel like I'm too purist or I'm too, like I'm part of a dying tradition, you know, like a dinosaur of the blues really. And uh, <coughs> there have been times in my past when I thought, well, I've got to pack this in because it's lonely. You know, maybe I should become more of a rock and roll musician so I can hang out with the other guys. But when Robert came along, I thought, oh, there's someone else that likes this stuff and plays it too. So it made me feel more at home. Do you remember when you got your first guitar? Yeah. When was it? Well, I was, I was about 15. Well, the, the, when I bought my first guitar, that is, my grandmother bought me a guitar when I was 13, and I couldn't, I mean, that was just pure whim. I said I wanted a guitar, and she bought me one. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't play it. I never learned how to play it, so it wasn't until when I was 15 that I bought one very cheap and learned to play. Do you remember the first feeling of it? I mean, did you sort of immediately? Hit well, it was it off very with foreign. It, it wasn't looking, you know, it, it looked so easy for people like Buddy Holly and Elvis Presley, the way they held the guitar. But you actually got one. It just like, it was funny. And the strings hurt. And I had no idea, no idea. And it, it really was uh, purely for love of listening to music that I, that I started to play, just a, you know, a little bit at a time. Did you like the sound of it, your own sound? Yeah, because it's one instrument where you can hit one string with a, a plectrum. Just hit one string and it sounds good. Or maybe hit two strings. And you, inv you start to invent it, you know, yourself. And you think you're writing and you're learning. And, and it is enjoyable as you're doing it. Not like I would imagine playing the violin. You know <laughs> what I mean? It would sound awful when you're learning. But the guitar sounds good when you're learning. Did you ever consider another instrument? Yeah, when I was a kid I wanted to play trumpet, violin, drums, all of them. Yeah? Yeah. So how come you chose? Well, because the music that I was hearing that I really liked was being played on the guitar, you know. And I do Buddy Holly. I mean, I guess the only other person that, what, you know, that I really liked was Jerry Lee Lewis, and, but piano was inconceivable. I mean, you, know, you, can't, you can't just go out and buy a piano, or his guitar is much more accessible. You know? mm. Mm, right. What, what do you think is the best thing about the guitar? I mean, is, is it sort of is it the sound of it, or is it the feel of it, or is it what it can do? I think it's so adaptable. You can yeah. carry it around, you can play it in your room, you can, you can amplify it and play it to thousands of people. You can play it with a slide, you can, with a bottleneck, or and you can play rhythm, you can play lead, you can use it as accompaniment, you can use it as a voice. Mm. It has so many uses, you know. Mm. I, don't think, I can't think of any other instrument that is that versatile. Very few white musicians actually play that kind of the kind of blues that you played in the 60s. There weren't many then. There are a lot more now. Yeah. Why do you think that was? Did you feel that it was, was it just you picking up from your idols or was it, I mean, was it not done? Um, I think the problem was with most players, even today, is that they, we were talking about this earlier on with some other friends of mine, that um, they look at the people that are immediately influencing them like the modern guitar players, and they stop there. They think that that's where it started. So people that listen to me, if they're listening to me now or they were listening to me in the 60s or 70s, they think I started it. Hmm. They don't choose to go beyond what I do and, and find out what I was interested in. And that's, that mystifies me because that's what I did. I mean, I heard Buddy Holly and I heard Elvis Presley and I, and I wanted to know what they were listening to. I wanted to know where it came from. So I it became my obsession <laughs> and my kind of scholarship in a way, like being at school to find out where it started. And I would go back, you know, through uh, Muddy Waters and uh, through all the people that came from Mississippi and Chicago and, uh, and try and uh, examine it and learn every aspect of it. And I think that's, 
what is fascinating about guitar playing mm. and, and the blues and rhythm and blues and rock and roll. It, you, there isn't a record made that has any soul that didn't come out of the blues, mm. you know. And even people today like Prince and Bobby Brown and they sing the blues. I mean, it's, it's there. If you know a little bit about it, you can hear it. Mm. And if it doesn't, I'm not really that moved by it. What, what did it feel like when you met them? Was it a letdown or was it...? It was very scary, but it's yeah. incredibly exciting. Incredibly exciting. But did you mind playing to them or with...? Well, yeah, because yeah. all I could do at first was play like them. Mm. Especially like people like Freddie King. I'd copied him all my life. Mm. And here he was on stage with me, and what could I do that wasn't like him? You know, that was, that's when it was really hard to come up with something of my own. Can you hear what kind of musicians have copied you? I mean, can you sort of see, oh, that's me, he likes me, or can you s trace it? No, I can't actually, because I think, um, I can sometimes, and, I, and uh, I can hear, for instance, people that are copying George. At least you've got one, one fan that sort of followed you yeah. through the years. I, yeah. I was thinking about George Harris, and who wrote the song for you. Yeah, yeah, we did, a, we did three or four songs, in fact, for the album, and I selected that one because I thought it was more complimentary to the rest of the album. The, the other songs we did were more rock and roll-y and more, in fact, more pop song-ish. And uh, I thought this one would be more different, you know, it would set the album off perfectly. The two of you go back a really long way. A long way, back to the early 60s, yeah. I mean, in fact, I was with the Yardbirds when I first met George and he, we were on the, the Beatles Christmas show. And uh, we hit it off and I love him very much. He's a great guy. Kind of a bit like an older brother, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You must be hard to keep up friendships in this business. Though. I mean, you move a lot, you work all over the place. And well, as time goes by, I mean, uh, it's a bit like when you're at war. You know, that you know, you stick together, and it's like the old guys now. We uh, we do stick together because of all the competition. You know, and like I find that I have more in common with people that have survived the '60s and the '70s. You know, we've got the same sort of attitude, you know, and every one of us really, like Elton and the Stones and George and all of the guys really, they're much more mellow now, and uh, we value one another's friendship, you know. You've gone softer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> in some ways, harder in others. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> such as. <laughs> you would have to ask me that. I guess um, just more resilient, you know, mm. more resilient, you, t you roll with the punches better when you get a little more experienced. You don't, I don't tend to suffer from criticism or, or from mistakes as much as I used to. I used to be very, very insecure about reading bad reviews, things like that. Really? Yeah. They had a very profound effect on me earlier on and now I'm not so moved by it, you know. I'm more uh, secure in myself, I guess. When so many people really sort of care a lot about what you did in the past, does that, is that difficult for you? Do, do you sort of feel that they like your past better than they like your future? Yeah. Or your present? Yeah, yeah. and I think that's sometimes, that's sometimes tied in with their own lives, you know? Mm. Like uh, when they got married, you know, <laughs> or something like that. They, they, they kind of like, they know the song that Cream did the first time they took their first, their first girlfriend out or something. And so it's not real, it's like their own nostalgia they're suffering from. It's nothing to do with me at all. What was it that made you so great? Well, it was that kind of the, the value that we all placed on one another. And because there was so little of it happening, it was much more important. Mm. You know, the centers were, uh, were New York, San Francisco and London. Mm. And there was probably two bands in each town that were worth <laughs> going to see. So, I mean, it was really like, oh God, this is exciting stuff, but mm. It's better now, I think. You've got so much more choice. Yeah, but I mean, it must have been something. It must have been something that you had, something that you did. Well, it was, I mean, from my, my personal point of view, it was a great time in, in my life because I was in my early 20s and, uh, you know, that part of your life is always exciting mm. because you, you feel like the, the world is your oyster, you know. <laughs> but uh, in a realistic sense, mm. it, no, it's a myth. Really? I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you think it would have done today if you sort of put up cream today? Would it sort of have disappointed It wouldn't anybody? stand up. It wouldn't stand up. Mm. I mean, there's, there's, you know, at least 20 or maybe even 30 heavy metal bands that are far better mm. than what the cream were mm. in their day. I mean, we had, we had our moments and there are, you know, some good things on record that we did. But live, a lot of it was just uh, rough, you know. I mean, we had a good time, but there's... It, today it wouldn't it wouldn't survive it really wouldn't but did you move on from them even before sort of before people did it I mean did you feel that the same at, at the time no 
No, I guess we thought we were the bee's knees at the time. <laughs> you know. uh, I think we were all egomaniacs. We had to be. We couldn't have made that music unless we were really very headstrong. Mm. Mm. But was it nice being in, in, that in a band that close? I mean, that sort of little nucleus of treatment. Uh, it was a little claustrophobic, I yeah. think. I don't think I could experience that again because uh, you're living with one another. We were doing like tours that went on for six months, playing seven nights a week, constantly living with one another. And I don't, you know, that's too much. There's no balance in that kind of life. <laughs> you know, it's just, let's have a break, you know. My life is better now. It's much better pay. I mean, I work hard, but I rest as well, you know. And, uh, I, I have a close relationship with my, the musicians I play with, but we all go home to different places and we let one another breathe. We don't stay in one another's pockets. Mm. And I don't think you can do that. No? No. But when you look back, if you sort of, what, what, is, what do you consider the high point in your career, if you sort of I think, value um, it for yourself? Well, the high points were, I guess John Mayer was, you know, when I was first finding my feet as a blues guitar player, yeah. and I was being inspired and encouraged by John and being fed and nurtured you know he really did a great job of making me value myself and bringing me out you know and then again when I uh, was in when we were forming and playing in the early days with Derek and the Dominoes playing with my first American band yeah yeah that was really exciting because these guys knew what it was all about you know they weren't imitators they were real musicians from Tulsa Oklahoma that knew about everything that I liked, you know. So that was one of the high points. And then later in the 70s, before I got kind of overwhelmed by booze and drugs and everything, when I had the band, the same, same band, but, you know, doing 461 and Slow Hand and these albums. Mm. And then I guess, you know, coming, coming to work with Phil and, and then now with Greg Phil and... I read that you got an award the other day from Prince Charles from being 25 years in the music business. Yeah. What was that like? It was very touching. Yeah? You know, yeah, I th it was at um, one of the Prince's Trusts. I think it was the last one I did. And uh, it was a surprise. I didn't know it was going to happen. And I was, I, he does this thing where you line up. All the musicians that are going to play that night line up. He comes down and shakes your hand. And he had this thing, you know, it was like a, a beautiful solid silver guitar on a little pedestal with an inscription saying congratulations for 25 years of making music from His Royal Highness Prince Charles. Oh. That was very nice. Yeah. Yeah, it was a nice little pat on the back. Do you get it when you get young people who sort of want to work with you? Do you find that they're all struck by you or that, they're sort of, that you're this guitar god that they're very afraid of talking to even? Or? Well, a lot of it can depend on the way I behave, I think. I mean, if I was, uh, if I was uh, discourteous, um, or if I played, play acted being God, I mean, or whatever, you know, if I used my ego as a weapon, mm. you could make people feel really, not, you know, shabby or, or small, but when I'm introduced or if I meet a young musician that I know in advance thinks I'm good, you know, or as I've inspired him or whatever, I try and put him at ease and mm. it, generally we, it works mm. very well. But I don't, you know, I don't have that, I have had in the past, but I don't have that high opinion of myself. I'm just another musician. Why is that? Way, because that's the way, it's the most healthy way to look at it. But it can't be easy, I mean everybody else is sort of putting you on pedestals and admiring you. Yeah, I guess you've got to just throw that out the window, you know, mm. and just remember who you are, that you're just a hard-working guy that, who has his ups and downs, you know. I'm not always playing to my best ability, you know, and I live with that. Mm. Is that hard? Do you sort of feel that you always should? No, it's actually harder for me to have a good opinion of myself. Because, I mean, when you're making a record, for instance, you go in and you do four or five takes and you use the one that's best, and that's the one that people hear. They don't hear the bad ones. I do because I've made them and so I'm living with that I know that you know I make five times as many mistakes as I want to mm. and that keeps my feet on the ground <laughs> but when you hear for instance like the box set that was put up put out a year ago was it yeah that yeah. keeps my feet on the ground does too. it yeah. Yeah. yeah do you sort of do you want to get back and change it sure I mean I'd like to have gone back and extracted all the alcohol out of my body <laughs> and all the other things that <laughs> Can you hear it? Is it oh, terrible? I can hear myself. I can listen to that album and say, yeah, there's Coke on that one, it's uh, Brandy on that, you know. I can hear the state that I'm in. Really? Yeah. Uh. And it's a little embarrassing. How long did that period go on for? 
Well, I guess that throughout the the mid of the, the mid seven, well, the beginning of the set, like from seventy three till about eighty one, mm. I was really in, indulging in a lot of different stuff, far beyond my own uh, health could allow, you know, and it had to stop. It's a long period. Yeah. Do you sort of have any physical problems from it? I had, um, I, I got ulcers at one point, uh, I think about 1980, I was in, I was hospitalized in America with uh, three very bad ulcers. And I, I mean, I could have been, if I'd carried on, I would have killed myself, for sure. And I think my mental health suffered a great deal too, mm. you know, from, from overindulgence in booze. Mm. You know, you get paranoid and you get just generally very crabby, you mm. know, and a nasty person. You know, you develop a pretty nasty personality if you, if you indulge in any of these things. And people don't want to know you. You lose a lot of friends. How did you start? Well, I guess through the help of friends, you mm. know, through the help of friends, and, and becoming, you know, aware before it was too late that, mm. that, uh, that I had more important things to do, you know, that I wanted to live, mm. and I wanted to be uh, a creative musician. I think if I hadn't been um, granted some kind of gift as a musician, I probably would have been dead by now. Really? Yeah, because it's something to hold on to, you know? Mm. You know, even when I was really out of it, I, mean, I still knew that I was a guitar player, first and foremost. But now you even manage to sort of not get high then. I mean, you don't play the guitar and you don't take drugs. Yeah. So what do you do? Like now, for instance, you're on tour, you don't have your guitar with you. Yeah. What do you do? Well, I don't, I guess I don't have to get high all the time. <laughs> so that's what I mean. <laughs>